Hello, and welcome to another PDI podcast. I am your host, Mark Oliver Wright, Clinical Science Liaison for the Central Region. With me today is Dr. Timothy Wimkin, PhD, MPH, FAPIC, FSHA, CIC. Tim is an associate professor in the Division of Infectious Diseases, Allergy, and Immunology at St. Louis University in St. Louis, Missouri. He is the Director of Data Science and Epidemiology at the Institute for Vaccine Science and Policy, the Director of Infectious Diseases Epidemiology at SSM St. Louis University Hospital, and the Director at the Systems Infection Prevention Center. Dr. Wimkin has a doctorate in public health from the University of Louisville, where his research focuses on social networks for knowledge mapping in the field of infection prevention. He has authored and co-authored numerous manuscripts, national guidelines, and book chapters in the field of infectious diseases. He has served APIC as chair of the annual conference committee and is currently on the research committee. And he has also served on the SHADE nomination and awards committee, guidelines committee, and currently serves on the research committee. Welcome, Dr. Wimkin. Thanks for having me, sir. Recently, the CDC issued new guidelines with respect to the role of surface contamination with SARS-CoV-2 virus and the potential for transmission. They stated, quote, the principal mode by which people are infected with SARS-CoV-2 is through the exposure to respiratory droplets carrying infectious virus. It is possible for people to be infected through contact with contaminated surfaces or objects, but the risk is generally considered to be low. How does that correlate with what is known about other respiratory viral pathogens, including other coronaviruses? Well, I think uh, it's an interesting approach. I certainly wholeheartedly disagree (laughs) with all of their statements um, for a a lot of reasons, really. You know, first and probably foremost, it's not evidence-based, really, at all. It's it's more selective science than evidence-based science, which I, I think is become more of a, an issue over the past year, year and a half. Um, downplaying this is, is kind of detrimental to our overall prevention response because you can't decouple the relationship between respiratory droplets and surface contamination because the droplets are what's causing the surface contamination. And all of these respiratory viruses, be it a coronavirus, a seasonal one, SARS-1, SARS-2, MERS, uh, or you know, parainfluenza virus, RSV, flu, whatever. Um, they all survive on surfaces pretty well from hours to even weeks, really. Uh, and you know, we're talking about viruses, so it's not technically survival, but you know, act, viral activity, infectivity. So, you know, if someone coughs or sneezes, uh, talks, even whatever, any droplet that's going to come out of them is going to land on a surface. And if those viruses can can be active for any amount of time then surfaces are incredibly important. I mean, you think about how often you run into somebody or within a, you know, a distance to breathe their air directly versus how often you touch the surface and don't sanitize your hands properly and then touch your eyes or eat or whatever. You know, uh, that, that risk is, is certainly different. Now, I certainly don't want to downplay the importance of the person-to-person transmission because it certainly happens. And that's certainly very important, and that's why mask use is so important, because mask use is going to prevent uh, or facilitate prevention of, of both of those things, both surface transmission by preventing a large amount of, of respiratory droplets from landing on a surface, as well as the person-to-person transmission. And this is particularly important in kind of enclosed areas or areas with poor airflow, crowded conditions, that kind of thing. But it kind of brings us back to the evidence, and you know, if you look at the actual evidence, SARS-CoV-2 is really found on surfaces much more than it's found in the air, even around symptomatic people. I mean, of course, there's some uh, evidence to the contrary, but the the overwhelming majority actually has shown that surfaces are where they're finding the virus more often. So, again, I'm not sure of what the agenda is for this, but um, I certainly follow the, the need to keep our bundled approach or our Swiss cheese approach where you know, because you can't decouple these transmission modalities, we have to layer interventions because some are going to be, I mean, we're not going to be doing anything perfectly. Not everyone's going to be wearing a mask and not every mask is the same. Uh, Not everyone's going to be washing their hands. Not everyone's going to be disinfecting surfaces properly with the proper things. 
So we need to layer all of these things um, because bundles work and that's where the evidence is. Hmm. Fascinating. So when they say the risk is low from contaminated surfaces, should healthcare facilities ease up on what's been described as their more stringent protocols for cleaning and disinfection over the past year? Certainly not. Um, you know, uh, I think uh, an enhanced focus on the environment is really great for all kinds of things. And I think it's it's one of those situations where maybe we need to start thinking outside of SARS-CoV-2. Um, you know, a, a great example is is influenza. And you think about what happened with influenza over the past two years and due to our basic interventions, you know, several hundred kids die in the U.S. every year from flu. One died last year. So we're talking about basic interventions, wear a mask in hygiene. These are, uh, you know, interventions that no matter how you spin it, they really take minimal effort. And we've saved hundreds of kids' lives uh, in one year because of this basic stuff. So, uh, and then in the hospital setting, you know, folks on the environment, it's always a struggle. Uh, you know, EBS is, is a critical aspect of our prevention efforts for all kinds of things, C. diff or, you know, CRE, any, any of these pathogens. So uh, enhancing our focus on that is only going to save more lives and improve patient safety. Well, in that vein, do you think that supplemental disinfection, such as either electrostatic sprayers or UVC light pose, uh, post-cleaning, have any benefit? You know, I, I, I'm not sure that we have kind of good enough evidence to document certainty uh, of these things. You know, evidence is, is all over the place because those types of studies are really hard. Um, I think the environment is one of those situations, much like, you know, uh, mask use and that kind of thing. It, it's hard, you can't, since you can't really decouple the environment from other transmission modalities very easily. Um, those studies are really hard to do and they're very expensive. Um, but it, it's kind of hard to, argue against uh, any supplement because that's exactly what it is, a supplement. But that's what really is the important piece of all this is it has to be driven really hard in our education platform to environmental services and other folks that these are supplemental interventions. So it doesn't mean that you can kind of do a sloppy job with our basic cleaning and disinfection routines. That totally makes sense. So looking back over the past year, year and a half or so, what surprised you most about how the pandemic has played out? You know, I, I don't know if it's necessarily surprising, but <clears throat> the that interplay between politics and prevention has been, uh, it's been something. <laughs> you know, it, it's sad to see that basic hygiene <laughs> and prevention efforts as, as any political thing, really public health should, is kind of apolitical at its core. Um, I mean, you don't see, you don't, you know, come out of the bathroom after, after using the toilet and, you know, washing your hands and someone yelling at you because you washed your hands after you used the toilet. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, I'm not sure why it has to be like that for SARS-CoV-2. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not going to end this on a low note. So, uh, you know, maybe the most surprising thing to me and I think surprising thing to a lot of people was really the the effect the efficacy of the and effectiveness really for, of the mRNA vaccines. It's been completely amazing to see how well these vaccines have worked. And you know, we've just dis discussed this before. Uh, and people are always concerned that, you know, well these vaccines are untested and and of course we know that in reality the science has been around for for decades. You know, this this is mRNA vaccine technology. It's not new at all. Um, we've never had a licensed vaccine before under that platform, but we've been studying it for a very long time. And that's kind of what one thing I always say to people who are hesitant to get vaccinated because of their concern for, you know, these vaccines being rushed or, or whatever. Um, and it's really not that we rushed this. It's that we never really had any fire beneath us to in, in any need to, to get anything out. So we we never work together, and that's really what <laughs> drove these vaccines to work. Is that you know we worked worldwide, and it shows what science can do and what science can accomplish when we collaborate for a common need. So certainly, these vaccines are the most highly scrutinized drugs, not even just a vaccine, but drugs ever released to the public. Uh, and you know, I would consider them safer than you know taking a couple of ibuprofen because you have a headache. 
<laughs> one seeing the science play out in a in a you know, a public forum like we have over the past year. It, it's interesting to see the public's reaction to all that. Yeah, and uh, yeah, the news cycle is is uh, never ending. <laughs> the right. science is not not that fast, really. So it it's hard to to keep track of of what's real and what's not real and the misinformation. Excellent. Uh, you know, before we close out, I, I, I've got to share my favorite fun fact about us. You and I both grew up in rural northwest Illinois. In fact, we grew up about, I think, 19 miles apart from one another. <laughs> <laughs> what are the odds that two boys growing up in the middle of nowhere that close apart would have uh, both gravitated towards infection prevention? <laughs> I have something in the water. I don't know. <laughs> Well, thank you for joining me today, Dr. Wimkin. It's always a pleasure to speak with you, and I am sure our audience benefited from your insights. Oh, thank you, Sarah. I appreciate it. Always great to talk to you. This has been another PDI podcast. Thank you for joining us, and thank you for all that you do each and every day as you continue to be the difference.